I'm Paolo Abeni. I work for Red Hat in the networking services team. I use it to add back to the UDP protocol implementation inside the kernel. Then I move it to add bugs to the MPTCP protocol implementation inside the kernel. And I currently mostly get blamed by Linux. That is, he is one of the upstream uh, maintainers of networking tree. <laughs> and I'm Marcelo, uh, I also work for Red Hat in the networking services team and one of my main uh, responsibilities in the past time, uh, recent, it's on integrating OVS hardware floating in our products. Okay. Today we are going to talk to you about networking performances. Uh, it's full. Oh, great. Okay, so uh, we are going to give a very brief introduction about networking performance in general, and then we will focus on, sorry, on a couple of cases of study that we use to demonstrate some interesting, strange results, how to investigate them using common tools and perhaps how to improve things in some cases. And we will draw some conclusions, hopefully. Uh, what about, what's the big fuss about networking performances? Uh, in the end, they boils down to measure the maximum amount of packet per, per seconds or message per seconds, or the max throughput that a given host is able to, prox to process, usually on a single core. That is mostly by convention, because we hope that things will scale on multiple cores, even that is not always true. And also because the uh, setups are much more simple when we use a single core. That is in turn actually unfair in, with respect to some architectures that have less power for full GPUs, but possibly much more course available. Uh, why we do performance testing? For many good reasons. To uh, detect bottlenecks, to avoid regressions, to tuning setup, uh, etc. So uh, when we speak about performances, we are not interested in functional behavior. We assume that everything works just as expected, and we instead are interested in raw num round numbers. Uh, for that, we avoid using uh, well-known and very useful tools like TCP down, Wireshark, Packet Drill, etc. And we instead focus on using uh, packet generators, either in user space like iPerf or NetPerf, or kernel space packet generator like PackageGen. That tools usually provides uh, the statistics we are looking for, but more often than not, we need to have other aggregate counters that the, the kernel can provide, and we can inspect with other tools like Netstat that gives us uh, per protocol aggregate counters or as, uh, socket stats that give us per socket uh, information. Uh, and more often than not, we are interested in into looking uh, where our CPU cycle are actually spent, and today we will use a lot uh, the perf tool. So uh, let's move to the case of study. The first one is a very simple one, that is um, receive throughput for an UDP uh, application. Uh, why this one? Because it's a very common thing that uh, most uh, even telco does. First thing, how fast we can go, let's measure how many packets we are able to receive. Uh, this step is very, very simple. We have a host that runs a packet generator, in our case, packet chain. We use packet chain as packet generator because we don't want the transmitter being the bottleneck. We want to measure the performance of the receiver. Uh, the receiver runs on another host. It's a very simple UDP application. Here there is the URL where you can find it. Uh, just read packets and drop them. Uh, we use that one because at 
a lot of command line option that can be used to configure its behavior. The two hosts are connected by a fast link, 10 gigabit in our case, the faster the better, and we are using two Melanox NIC on both the sender and the receiver. Uh, whatever hardware you are going to use for this kind of experiment, you will have slightly different figures, but the whole trend should be the same on most re re um, recent uh, server class hardware. Uh, so we want to have we want to see how fast we can go in this scenario, how many packets the receiver is able to process, and uh, we want to get some more stable results. For that, we are going to pin the user space process application on a given core, and we are going to pin the kernel space processing on another core. Also, we are going to disable IRQ balance that could move uh, the, kernel uh, the kernel processing on random core random cores in unexpectedly make the figures we measure sort of random, and we want to avoid that. So that given, we are going to do the first uh, test with a somewhat random, um, somewhat default configuration. Uh, the only perhaps unusual thing is that uh, firewall D uh, is, is disabled, and um, yeah, we don't have a, a net filter table rules. And this is what we see, uh, 1 million 660 uh, packets per second, which is not bad. Uh, it's quite higher than we would have got a few years ago with the same hardware. Uh, but we want to see, understand if that is the maximum we can get. Uh, so we attach the perf tool to the receiver. The perf tool can measure how many cycles are spent in any function executed by a given core, and we report that. We are using a command line uh, report. Uh, the main information there are the name of the function, where CPU is spending cycles, and the percentage of CPU cycles spent in every function. You can see that most of the time is spent copy packet, copying data from the kernel space to the user space, not that many times, roughly 20% 20, 20 of the whole CPU time. And we can see that below that, the four topmost offenders are a function related to syscall overhead, let's say. There is the libc receive message syscall, which is the syscall used by the application to actually fetch uh, the packet uh, from the kernel. And the other ones instead are uh, related to security content measures for recent hardware vulnerability and to the Seninox uh, security tool inside the kernel. So the bottom line is that we are spending a lot of time due to syscall overhead. Uh, and the application is receiving one packet for every Cisco. So we could think that if we use a different Cisco that allows us to process many packets uh, with, a single Cisco, with a single call, it could save a lot of time and possibly going faster. There's Cisco actually exists. It's called receive M message, where the first M stands for multiple. And we can change the behavior of our tool with a command line argument to tell it to use such Cisco. So let's do it and measure whatever we see. Surprise, surprise, we are slower than before. Miserably slower than before. And that is quite unexpected. We hope it to go slightly faster. Why? Uh, simply running the top uh, command line tool give us some information somewhat. As we can see, in the first uh, experiment, the user space process took 88% roughly of one CPU. And now it's taking much less. So we are really go faster. But still we are processing less packets, less packets. Why? Because the bottleneck is not, in this case, the user space process. The bottleneck here is the kernel space uh, processing the other process you can see in the top report, case of RQD. 
which is keeping a CPU fully busy. Still, we are faster. Why we see less packet? Uh, because to actually walk up a process, the CPU needs to spend some cycle. The faster is uh, the user space process, the more frequently such process go to sleep, more frequently the kernel space process need to walk it up. And more CPU cycles, cycles has to spend to walk, wake that process up. Less CPU cycles that CPU has available to actually process packet. So the bottom line is that with our first report, uh, we are our first perf, perf tool investigation, we have looked to the wrong CPU. We should have looked to the other one, the one processing uh, the kernel space stack. So let's look at that now, and this is what we get. And we can see that the topmost offender, the function that is burning more CPU cycle, is that INET GRO receive, and we have another function quite, still quite high in that ranking with the, that GRO word inside. Both of them are uh, related to the GRO engine. The GRO or engine is a very lower uh, component of the networking stack, is in charge of aggregating as much packet as possible as seen on the wire in a single giant packet that will later traverse the whole networking stack. Uh, so uh, it, that kind of technique allows the networking stack to save a lot of CPU cycles when it's able to aggregate packets because uh, as many as 40 wire packet will be processed by the networking stack at once. Uh, the bad thing for this experiment is that uh, the UDP protocol does not leverage GRO by default. So that cycle are actually completely wasted. Uh, what we can do, we could disable GRO. Uh, that it is a thing that we can do in this experiment because we are interested just in UDP. In general, it's a bad thing to do because there is also t uh, the TCP protocol, which is what they use it somehow. And if you disable uh, GRO, uh, TCP performance will sink uh, dramatically. Anyhow, uh, we can disable it via the it TH tool with the command line reported over there, and we can repeat the experiment. And finally, we get some progress. If you compare the number with that we had on some slide ago, you can see that we get some uh, miserable improvement with no change at all in our code, just with a somewhat better configuration, at least for the this test. Still, we have uh, some surprise. There is uh, what the perf tool is reporting now uh, as the topmost offer for the kernel space processing. And as you can see, that is completely different from what we had before. Yes, the GRO thing is gone because we disable it, but the other function are just have just random number with respect with what we have before. Very different uh, CPU usage. Why? Uh, because when we process a packet coming from uh, the net, no matter what we do, we will have cache misses for every given packet because the packet contents are fresh. Are just put into memory by the DMA engine, and that memory, is co that memory contents for the CPU point of view is completely new. That means cache miss. That cache miss before happened in the GRO engine, and that was one of the reasons why it was so costly. Now the GRO engine is not running anymore, but still we have that cache miss, and whatever function is actually Experience that cache miss is getting its cost exploded, sort of. So uh, we are still interested in see we can improve uh, the throughput sometimes. Down the list, 
uh, taking very little CPU cycle, we see that UDP v4 early demand function. Even is, is taking uh, very few cycles, that is somewhat relevant because uh, that early the MOOCs function is trying to look up for a connected socket for each incoming packet to avoid later root lookup. But uh, in our experiment, the UDP socket is not connected. So that very, uh, little amount of CPU cycle are completely wasted. wasted. And we, will avoid, uh, we can avoid that with a, a simple CCCL disabling that early the MOOCs functionality. We execute a CCTL and we repeat the experiment. We hope to see some improvement. Oh, and we see that. And unexpectedly, that's a huge improvement. 10%, that's, wow, we just uh, change, mm, remove the little overhead and we got a relevant improvement. Why? Uh, because so far I uh, lied blatantly, uh, the figures are not that stable overall, uh, and they are not that stable because um, power management is enabled on the host we are using, and power management kick in at an ex unexpect unexpected moment, and when it kicks in, results are sort of varying. Anyhow, the trend, uh, it, repeating many tests, etc. the trend is like that. If you disable GRO, you will see an improvement. If you disable uh, early demos, you will see another improvement. Uh, so, uh, we are still interested in maximizing our throughput. And we can try something slightly different. We say that, that uh, we can first look again at our perf report and notice that there are a few functions that are related to root lookup that they are consuming quite a bit of cycles. And we mentioned it before that early the MOOCs functionality could avoid the root lookup. So we could try re-enable it and change our user space tool, change the configuration of our user space tool to actually connect the ODP socket upon reception of packets. That can be done only if uh, the ingress UDP traffic is just for a single flow. In our experiment, it's just for a single flow, so we can, single flow meaning a given L4 tuple. UDP uh, IP source destination, sorry, source IP destination IP, source port destination port. So we uh, re enable early demos and we change the configuration UDP sync and rerun the test. And great, we see a relevant improvement. We have moved to more than 2 million packets per second from the beginning 1.6, which is more than 20% improvement and with no, no changes at all to, our, to the code of our application, just a slightly different setup. Uh, if we go back and look at the uh, top uh, tool output, we see that now both CPU are fully busy. So we may conclude that we are at the of our journey. No more performance improvement are possible. And that will be false. Uh, because we mentioned it at the beginning that UDP, uh, sorry, GRO could give a great booster to bulk transfer, and GRO is not enabled by default for UDP, but can be enabled on a per socket basis if the uh, application creating the socket requ requests it. Uh, UDP sync does not support that, op that option, so no figures, no real figures for that, but if you fetch the source, modify that to enable a UDP uh, GRO, which a simple set sock option, and then use receive a message because at that point the bottleneck will be back on the user space part. Then you will see something with this hardware around three million and a half packet per seconds, which is much more than what we see now. 
that will be the end? No, because if nobody from the security team is watching, you could try disabling Selenux and possibly disable also Red Pauline and uh, security mitigation. I'm not suggesting to do that. You can do that in control lab if, where everything is under your control and your responsibility. And if you do that, you can probably reach something around four million packets per second, which will be almost three times the initial figures. And that will probably be the greater number you could get for this kind of hardware. And with that, I leave. All right, thanks, Pablo. Um, moving on to our next case of study, uh, I'll be covering uh, the situation on which we partially use the hard offloading that we can do with OVS and TC. Um, so yeah, completely different from the use case before. I'll briefly explain because how OVS hard offload works, because that's not really common yet, but I'll assume that you know how OVS works. Um, here we have a, a picture on how uh, a standard OVS works. Packets are coming through the NIC, they go through OVS, and then they connect to network namespace uh, using VE, right? So that's pretty standard. Uh, with hard offload, it leverages uh, SROV, it creates virtual functions uh, in the switch dev mode on which the, the flows, they are processed in a programmable way, unlikely uh, from the legacy SRV model, on which the card itself does many things on its own. So that's the benefit of using the switch dev mode. And then the picture comes like this. You have the NIC, you have the network namespace, and assuming that this flow is already floated, packets come directly from the wire into the network namespace, and vice versa. This is the fully offloaded way. And then when we go to the half situation, which is, for example, when you are doing contract, you are doing decapsulation, but for some reason you can't output to a virtual function inside that network namespace, but, so you have to use a VE tunnel, the card can't output directly into that, so it will offload all the processing up to that moment, and then it has to resort to a software fallback to do that. So in the picture, it's pretty much the same thing, um, but the last step going uh, into the network namespace is not offloaded, it's processing hardware, and then on, on the way back to the wire, it's entirely done in software because when it's coming from this VE tunnel, it's impossible to do a floating at that time. Uh, the network card user was a ConnectX 6DX. The sender was a rel 8, receiver rel 9, so it's very, very fresh. The test was simple uh, TCP stream with a perf. Uh, test results that we were, we get, we got here. Um, we are testing just uh, with TC data path then, we're not using OVS kernel, uh, but we are leveraging skip hardware switch so that we can say, okay, run entirely in software or leverage offload whenever possible. And the idea on trying to leverage this partial offload in there is that using dedicated hardware is usually better than using a generic processor for doing uh, the computational work. And at the same time, it's creating some parallelism quite often out of the blue, because when the card is processing a packet, it, it finishes, delivers to the OS to do the, the last remaining part, and then it's already processing the next packet. So you're getting some parallelism for free in there, right? So we should get a performance bump, uh, but not. Something happens. We get a worse performance than doing entirely in software. So what's happening here? Why did we go from 18 to 11 gigabits per second? That's quite a drop. And if we check, this is entirely software. We are using uh, Skip Harder on the sender side. Um, we can see the CPU usage is quite okay. Um, no CPU is being uh, maxed out, no bottlenecks here. On the receiver side though, yes, we are maxing it out. So the receiver is the bottleneck. And then if we move to the half, offload situation. On the sender side, still not um, maxing out CPUs. And on the receiver side, still the same figures. 
So what we can conclude from here already is that when we go on this half of full load situation, apparently on the receiver side, we lose 50% of efficiency. Because we are using the same uh, amount of processing to do half of the work. And then we don't know what's going on, so let's talk, start top bottom. Uh, first thing, check TCP stats thing to check if things are going uh, right or wrong in there. Uh, do you see something off in here? I don't. Because <laughs> there are no retransmissions, there are no drops, it's just, uh, it's really clean. But the numbers are lower, so the problem doesn't seem to be on TCP. Let's move down. Um, this is on software. Uh, we have our baseline, that is this one. Uh, we are not debugging and trying to make something just better, but we, we are comparing A and B. Um, and this is one output of, of perf. Unlike Leon Paulus, uh, the left column in there is the accumulated time, uh, accumulated CPU uses that this functions and its uh, colleagues are using. And nothing stands, stands out, uh, although this is the baseline. And when we try to compare um, to the half of load situation, it's not too different. So how do we move on from here? Uh, one idea is pick one, <laughs> right? Um, no, uh, with previous knowledge, we know that this function is quite important. It's the one that gets called in the driver when it's processing a packet that the Nick just delivered to it. So we can dive into it. And if we didn't know that, we can go on over uh, every function. It will take a, a little bit longer, but it will get us there. And then we expand that view. We have these differences. Um, here, it's the, the software one and the, hard, uh, the harder half of loaded one. Okay, we can see it's doing more stuff and different stuff in here, but at the same time, we don't have a, a good idea on what these numbers are meaning. Okay, it's using less, uh, CP, spending less CPU time on MAPI, GRO, receive, but it, what does that mean? Uh, we can't uh, make some sense out of it to get. So, finding bugs, it's harder than find a wall, right? <laughs> um, when we go on check and trying to understand what those numbers mean, these screens, they, they are counting how many times these functions are getting called. And during this experiment, um, this one here, NAPI Jaro receive, was getting called seven million times. And as Paul was explaining, this is the function that coalesces packets into a bigger one that the networking stack will process later. And when we go half of load, it gets called four million times. And if you do the math between these two, it's pretty much a drop that we had in, in the throughput. Okay, well now we are starting to talk. And the other two functions that uh, appeared, CT restore flow and wrap TC receive, they are uh, also getting called that much. It was called a lot in here, but previously it just returned it, so it was like a blank call. But now um, we have them quite present in there. And if we are half of loading, um, interesting to note that the contract in here didn't uh, get entirely removed from it because we still have calls for it that are legitimate in the software processing, even though that is half of loaded because the transmit path is not of loaded, right? And also we have calls for it inside the network namespace. Um, so yeah, it's really not easy still to make some sense out of these numbers. So let's move back to this window and then let's expand it because now we have some more knowledge on it and it makes it easier to understand it. When I expand uh, this function calls, we can see that because of the fallback to software, what it is doing is, in order to restore the contract entry, it is doing packet header section at the driver level, which is before GRO, 
Um, it is doing, it's consulting X array two times. It's doing memory allocations two times for XB extensions and for the tunnel destination. And memory allocations, as you may know, they are really not uh, cheap. Uh, it's consulting another RS table. And this is all getting done before GRO. So the driver will do all this stuff for this packet, and then we'll give this packet to the GRO engine, which will realize that it belongs to the previous packet, uh, to the same flow as the previous packet, and we'll merge them. And all this effort, it was needed to do GRO, but it's not discarded because it's part of this bigger packet. And that's why uh, recovering this meta information from the packet that it was partially processed by the, by the hardware it's actually more expensive than doing it entirely in software. In software, if we were doing it, uh, we don't do any of this, and we just uh, aggregate the packets and do it only once. So you're talking about a trade of between doing 40 times of this to then aggregate a packet and throw it to the network stack, or just process them, aggregate 40 times, and then give to the ne network stack. So it's another attempt on getting some benefit of the hardware that backfires. Proper solution for this would be either avoid the situation or wait for the, the hardware vendor to support GRO hardware fluid so that we can have uh, the, the network stack and the hardware more aligned on how they work. Um, some conclusions on it is when dealing with performance expected and unexpected, uh, things may backfire and you may have more work to do. Uh, it hardly is something that, yeah, just flip that knob on and it will be fine because it really depends on the use case that you are working on. There is no size that fits all, so you can try to optimize the system as bad as possible for this use case, but for the other use case, it's different. And it may work, but it also may not work, and it may work uh, worse than if you didn't have done these optimizations. And there's this one tool that pretty much rules them all, that is perf tool. If you check the main page, it supports a lot of stuff that can, can help you. You will likely need some knowledge into the kernel, into the drivers, into the many subsystems that we have in there. But uh, it's a very helpful tool that is very worth the, your time. To, to understand it. And that's it. Any questions? I think we confused them all. <laughs> <laughs> Without Celine, oh, sorry, let, let me repeat. Uh, regarding the first uh, use case, uh, case of study, I say that we could have better uh, performances without Selenux. Uh, yes, that is actually well known, but don't tell Paul Moore, which is the Selenux maintainer. Well, he knows actually. Uh, if we go backward a little bit, one of the first slide here, you can see. Uh, the fourth topmost offender is that Selenux socket receive message. That uh, is the hook used by Selenux to perform and enforce uh, its policy. Its policy. Uh, if you disable Selenux at boot time, not making it uh, permissive, like adding Selenux equal zero at, on the kernel um, uh, command line, that uh, function will not be called at all, and that overhead will go away. Here is three something percent at greater packet rate that we can obtain with, GRO, with UDP GRO, that will be more visible, and removing that you will get some miserable, me, some relevant gain. But don't do that.
Excuse me, can you repeat the last part? Okay, so the uh, question regards uh, cache utilization. I mentioned that uh, new packets will, processing new packets will experience cache miss and you suggest uh, to disable caching for the packets to avoid that cache miss, if I understood correctly. Uh, yeah, but that will not solve the problem per se, uh, because uh, we see the cache line, the CPU see the cache, uh, the cache miss, because the CPU has to access the data for example, to fetch the MAC address for Ethernet processing, the IP address for IP processing, et cetera. So if you don't have the cache in between, we have to go all the way down to the main memory and spend a lot of CPU cycles. So you, in the end, it's exactly the same of having a cache miss there. Other questions? No, sorry, out of time, sorry.